Fresco. I am the operator for Black Goose Chimney Service, Inc. out of Baxton. We do service the Roanoke, Bedford, Lynchburg area. Go about uh, 50 to 60 miles in any direction from Thaxton. So it's a pretty large area. Okay. So when you're looking at a fireplace for somebody, um, if you're doing a cleaning or such, which we're not today, uh, you're going to inspect the flue. You're going to look up through the flue. Is that right? That, that is one of the things that we look at. Okay. Yeah. What else? Um, on something like this, this is referred to as a factory built fireplace. Yes. I would look for around the fireplace that might lead me to some idea of what type of use or abuse it has seen, and as well as exposure to the elements, and uh, maybe look for some indicators on if it was properly installed. Um, so one of one of the parts of, of our job is to diagnose house pressure issues to the best of our ability based on our observations of the fireplace as well. I see a couple of things here. We've got some smoke staining mm -hmm. uh, above the opening of the fireplace here. Um, a little bit on the bottom of the mantle as well. Mm -hmm. Additionally, I see some sooting on the inside of the glass doors. Lots of sooting, and they don't. They don't. Uh, they initially close nice and tight, but as time's gone on, they're now got these big gaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see some, looks like water staining here, as well as some compromised mortar at the bottom of the fireplace base. So, I, you know, I try to just get a general idea of what kind of use this thing has seen, how it's used. and. At the same time, try to work that in with what does the, the customer want as, a, as an end result, right? Do they want it to be in a wood fireplace? Are they interested in changing it up? Are they having an issue in particular that they might be able to address? Um, we perform varying levels of inspection according to NFBA 211, which is the National Fire Code. Different levels of inspection are applicable for different circumstances. Um, if I was to come in here and see your fireplace and see that the glass doors were sooted up, I would start the conversation with you about your use and your frequency of use and ask you questions like, do you ever run the fireplace with the glass doors closed? Only uh, at night when going to bed. Okay. And it's not usually full of everything. It's usually down to the last log or two, so it is still hot. But I don't want to leave it not closed and go to bed. Okay. And then from that, I would branch on to things like finding the data plate, which is going to be inside of the tire planks, one side or the other. And that's only because of being manufactured? Uh, yeah, okay. masonry fireplace will not have this tag in here. Okay. And here you can see on this fireplace that the tag is right here. And this tag will tell us everything about the origin of the fireplace, including the date of manufacture, uh, the name of the manufacturer, the model of the fireplace, and the serial number of the fireplace. And then from that, I can determine some of the requirements that the manufacturer has stated in their manual for the use or installation of this unit. Um, if, if I were inspecting this unit, I would also note things like your smoke deflector having some degradation on the front side here and some ash and sitting on the front side. And I would immediately look down beneath that and probably pretty quickly relate that to the use of what's called an aftermarket wood grate. An aftermarket wood grate is not a UL listed part. part. This is a UL listed tested and engineered fireplace. So it, it gets, you know, it, we move into some specifics there. Okay. And these are things that the average homeowner has no idea about. 
Has anybody ever, I had no idea. Has anybody ever used the term aftermarket wood grate? No, no. It is very much a thing. <laughs> so it, this it, is the equivalent it, um, of one or two the feet. original one rusted through mm -hmm. and uh uh went to Lowe's and purchased one which would be aftermarket. Yep. 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 So generally speaking, um It will say you know, they, a manufacturer of a UL-127 fireplace is extremely precise in their language. Okay. Right? But let's say you have a house built, you have a house placed, it's a general contractor or his crews that install this fireplace, they're not going to sit down with you and go A to Z, here's all the things you need to know. They're going to hand you the book, tell you to have a nice day and enjoy your new house. And that's pretty much as far as it goes. And if, if like me, we're purchasing this second hand, you don't get any of that mm -hmm. at all. So there is a book. A printed book as well as an online manual that comes with a unit like this. Okay. And one of the things that you can see on this data tag right here, like I said, they're very precise in the language. They always like to tell you, hey, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, mm -hmm. it could cost you your life. It says right here, big bold letters underline, warning, risk of fire hazard. Replace grate only with DESA model number 36GR. So that, what that means is... That's this, not appropriate. When this burns out, when the original one burns out, you can only replace it with the manufacturer's grate. Okay. The reason behind that is these prongs on the front tilt forward. Mm -hmm. The position of the flame bed is then moved forward towards the opening of the fireplace as well, thus placing heat directly beneath the smoke deflector and causing this paint to go away and all this soot and mess to go away. The real reason that that is an issue at all is the unit is tested, designed, and engineered with the idea of having the flame bed positioned closer to the back because directly behind this finish here, mm -hmm. directly on top of this metal, is a two by four holding it in place. Okay. So if we position fire directly beneath that two by four, I'm sure we can all come to a general conclusion on what that could mm -hmm. potentially lead to worst case scenario. So when you hire a professional to come into your house, one that specifically is, is certified, paint uh, those certifications, does have liability and workers comp, things like that, you should have a certain expectation of service. And it is highly likely that some, if not a majority of the things that they say are probably gonna, you know, if, if you're personally attached to your chimney, they're probably gonna hurt your feelings. So yeah. these are all the things that are It's the technician's job to observe, identify, document, and have conversations about operational deficiencies and operational it's really up to the technician to determine if his observations are hazards or deficiencies. And I think that's really important because I've been able to determine in five minutes the level of professionalism. When I purchased this home, um, I had a chimney sweep come and uh, it was something I wanted to do because I didn't know the history. And uh, insurance later required that I prove that as well. Um, he just simply looked up there, said it's fine, charged me $75 and have a nice day, mm -hmm. which was not at all what I, I mean, it took care of an immediate need, but it didn't do anything like you've just described, which shows just how much more there is to this. Always a, a good technician or the best technician. Nowhere in there is it included that you must have all the answers all the time. I don't have all the answers all mm -hmm. the time. But I know the right questions to ask and I know where to find the answers. That makes you the best technician in the world. Um, the first of those two, the former of those two traits is probably the most overlooked. I would say that it is fairly common if anybody was to come service your chimney, that they would put a brush inside of it. Um, they would probably look inside of it with a flashlight and mirror. Mm -hmm. And they would say, they would ask themselves internally, probably not audibly, but do I see an abundance of creosote? Do I see any animals? Do I see sticks and leaves? Is it straight? Is there any disconnections? Well, that's a good start, but it goes a lot further than that. Mm -hmm. A lot further than that. The reason for that is there has been so many times where 
say like in a higher end establishment, you walk inside, you look at the fireplace, it looks great, it's beautiful, it's awesome. And according to the person that's lived there for two years, it works great. Long-term exposure to heat is what causes fire. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't happen in the night. No agency qualified to tell you in exactly 100, 200, 300, 5,000 fires in this thing is going to burn your house down. Nobody can. What they can make observations on is installed for the manufacturer's instructions. Does it meet or exceed all minimum code requirements? That's the most important thing. I believe that all stems back to knowing the right questions to ask. Mm -hmm. It's it's generally speaking, it is not just simply a matter of can I physically do this. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the answer is yes. You can physically do anything that you put your mind to. But a better question would be, what are the requirements if I want A, B, or C? Mm -hmm. What what functions must I what's must I perform in order to accomplish that? Um, and do it in a code compliant manner. Just say, okay, well, I don't like my fireplace anymore. I think I want to put a wood burning insert in. And FBA 211 chapter 15 has a table that defines the necessity for no less than a level two inspection performed by a certified sweep. During that level two inspection, that sweep will gain access to your roof, to your attic, to your basement or your crawl space, and put a camera inside of each one of the flues on that same chimney. Um, what they're looking for is not just big, you know, uh, red flags, but also is it built properly? Has it been damaged by long-term exposure to the elements, including water or fire? Has it been used or abused and, and to what extent and in what manner? Um, is it a suitable, um, a suitable housing unit for the type of installation that you want to put in? And in the event that any, any, the answer to any of those questions is no, or yes, it's damaged, or water's done a lot of work to it, what would be the scope of work in order to get the customer or the homeowner or yourself to where you need to be from where you currently are? So when we go out and look at stuff, we do it from top to bottom, A to Z, tell you all the things you never wanted to know about your channel. We also create a plan based on what you've described to us as your uh, end goal. And we're pretty thorough. We definitely meet an FPA 211 minimum requirements and we even exceed those. Uh, one thing that's really important for a chimney technician is the ability to be empathetic without going as far as allowing someone to make decisions for themselves that could potentially endanger them. Anything that you think are the biggest problems you see of homeowners? Any of your top three or something that you see most often? Um, there is, there seems to be an overwhelming misconception that the burning of pine has caused all of their issues. When in reality, wet pine is just as bad as wet oak. Um, Burning pine is perfectly fine. Uh, like if you think about Northern California, all they have is pine. They, they burn. They don't have issues because they make sure that the moisture content of the wood that they're using for fuel is very low, specifically in California. Um, the same is true here. Pine is not inherently worse for the inside of your chimney than any other species. But not having a proper knowledge base on making sure that your fuel supply is properly seasoned. That's mm -hmm. extremely hard. I've seen people completely destroy their chimneys in less than a full, full burn season on a brand new chimney. Mm -hmm. um, there's another misconception that if you don't like your fireplace and it doesn't produce enough heat, you can just simply set a wood stove inside of it or in front of it and dump the pipe into it or, or just set it in the fireplace and close the surrounding. And that's something that hasn't been okay since the early 90s. Really, it's never been okay, but it's out loud not been okay since the early 90s. It causes house fire. You're trying to mix two things together that are not compatible. Really, the requirement is 
if you intend to have a solid fuel appliance that is UL listed and tested or otherwise uh, in use with a fireplace, you have to line the flue for this for that specific appliance and its requirements. Um, another, you know, overwhelmingly common frequent thing that we see is that there's masonry chimney, brick, stone veneer, block, any of those, drinks water as it's exposed to the smell or steam, and that water then transfers to the living space. Generally, we won't get a phone call about it until you're looking at your ceiling and there's a brown spot. But it's been happening for a long time. Mm -hmm. What you find the thing behind that finished walling or, or ceiling material is fully compromised frame members, as well as mold and mildew on the inside of the house. Additionally, it will destroy the chimney from the inside out. One other one that's really big, especially in Roanoke, there's a lot of older homes in you know, some of the smaller communities right outside of downtown that had masonry chimneys. Homes were built in the you know, early teens to late 40s. They currently use natural gas appliances as their primary heat. Those natural gas appliances will be venting through the chimney that is not suitable to vent them. The main byproduct of combustion on a high efficiency gas appliance is actually going to be water. Water is the most destructive element to a masonry chimney. The water that a natural gas appliance produces is not anything like the tap water. Specifically, it is extremely acidic. So it will degrade a chimney pretty quickly. We come in and make an observation like that. We use phrases like strongly suggest immediately repairing existing primary heat system exhaust. Um, you know, I'm not the chimney police, I can't do it. But it is extremely important that, that people be aware that, that they call somebody to come in and tell them all the things they don't want to hear. I've been in plenty of situations where. They were already exposed to carbon monoxide and didn't know it. Mm. That's you know that's that's probably one of the larger issues. Uh, specifically, they've got natural gas primary heat system. If somebody uh, were purchasing a house and it is an older home and has gas log, um, a home inspector isn't going to fly, but they're going to make sure that logs turn on and such. But it would be more beneficial to the purchaser for you to come out and go through and make sure that it's properly vented or or find any deficiencies that need to be corrected. Yes, um, I totally agree. To say that I had frequent interactions with several home inspectors that regularly inform their customers that they should have a level two inspection performed by a certified outfit. Those are the best home inspectors. Okay. They're not qualified, nor are they required to inspect your business. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, the National Board for Home Inspectors prevents them from being able to do that professionally under the licensing for their home inspection. Mm -hmm. Now, if they have another business on the side that is a chimney service business, that's fine. They can have reliability for that particular business. But as a home inspector, they can not. I all the time have in, uh, conversations with people where I'm you know, taking a brief look or a very detailed look at something and I say, okay, well, you've got A through Z wrong. I'm going to show you pictures and videos and we're going to talk about what it is, what may have caused it, and what's going to happen if you do nothing about it. And they say, well, the home inspector didn't say anything about that. That's fair. The home inspector is a generalist and I'm a specialist. Mm -hmm. Both my guys are specialists. I know a lot about chimneys. But, you know, radon, proper ducting, and things like that, I, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I'm not the guy to ask. <laughs> right. So, a home inspection does not protect you. Right. In the realm of chimneys, specifically. Okay.
Well, this has been educational and I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay.